This is the last lecture video for Lecture 15 on pathogenic bacteria for this week. In this lecture, we're going to discuss the transmission of infectious diseases. So this terminology you should familiarize yourself with regarding the different types of diseases and the way we classify them. So communicable disease. So this occurs when we can transmit that infectious agent from person to person. Um, although there are some infectious diseases that are more contagious, so that just means a degree of being in, in infectious. So contagious means just more infectious, especially through contact transmission, which we'll cover what that means today. And non-communicable means that this is an infectious disease, but it actually doesn't pass from person to person. So a good example of a non-communicable disease might be tetanus. So if somebody acquires tetanus, that is through a puncture wound into the skin, and then that person doesn't infect anyone else. So it is possible for the infectious disease to stop in one particular host. And that's because it's not a normal part of the life cycle of that bacteria to actually be inside of a human. So for example, tetanus finds that bacteria is found in soil. So it's mostly an environmental uh, microorganism that accidentally sometimes gets introduced into humans. So when we talk about whether or not uh, an infectious disease is communicable or contagious, one way to quantify that is to use a value called R0. So in epidemiology, we've, we've actually mentioned this term before, I know I've mentioned this to you before. It's called the R naught value. So it's a capital R with a little subscript zero. And what that R naught actually refers to, it refers to the reproductive potential of a pathogen. I also like to think of this as the number of secondary infections that can result from a primary infection. So we see here what the approximate R0 value is right now for SARS-CoV-2. The reason why it's an approximation right now is because we are in the middle of a pandemic. And so we don't have all the data at our fingertips right now. We just have some of the data at our fingertips right now because we are just now, we are in early April of 2020 when I'm recording this video and we are at what the experts are predicting is the beginning of the peak. So within the next few weeks, we are expecting to see the peak number of cases um, be recorded in the United States. And so that will provide more evidence and more data that can help scientists correctly quantify the R0 value because there's more to it. It's actually pretty complicated. I'm trying not to make it too complicated for you. But it has to do with, with two other values that scientists look, look at, which is the infectivity of the pathogen times the infectious period. And so the infectivity is actually a probability. So it's the probability of transmission to a healthy, from an infected person to a healthy person. An infected person to a healthy person. 
and then the infectious period, how long that person is actually infectious for. How long, how many days really? How many days, how long the infectious, infectious person can transmit the pathogen? So this is based on their best estimation right now for COVID-19, and it looks like it's gonna be around 2.5. So if we have one sick person with the illness, that sick person can transmit to approximately two and a half healthy people and infect them and make them infectious. And then each one of those would go and infect two and a half people. The general rule of thumb is that if you have an R naught value that's greater than one, then we see exponential growth of this infection, which is what we are seeing right now with the pandemic. And then if you are able to get that R0 value less than one, then we do see the disease go extinct in the population. Okay, so that gives you an idea of how we can use that number to quantify the so the R0 for COVID-19 is 2.5. Well, R0 for measles is actually 15, somewhere between 15 to 18, actually. So that means one person with measles can, the virus measles, can transmit to between 15 to 18 healthy people and infect them on average. So that would be contagious, highly contagious, which is why anytime we have somebody with measles and they go into a population of people that are either unvaccinated or are potentially able to be um, exposed to that virus, maybe they're children that are too young to be vaccinated, healthy people, um, it becomes a real concern and we can get that exponential growth going real fast for measles outbreaks. Now let's look at different methods of transmission or what we call modes of transmission for communicable infectious diseases as well as contagious as well. We call this the mode of transmission. So we look at really two different possibilities here for the mode of transmission. So one possibility is that we have direct contact, okay, with the pathogen. And then the other way, we have indirect contact or indirect transmission of the pathogen from infected people. Okay, so direct really falls into these three categories. So in the top box, we see these people kissing. So we would call that contact transmission. Contact, direct contact with somebody who is infectious. And so we would see that Kissing could potentially transmit the infectious agent, the pathogen, and that's because the pathogen is present in the saliva of these individuals. It can also be present in bodily fluids, so in semen or in vaginal secretions, so this would also transmit by, by um, sexual contact as well. And we would actually consider this 
mode of transmission to be droplet. So we are still seeing um, transmission from saliva or through respiratory secretions. This is why we have this social distancing recommendation or requirement. <laughs> Actually, now it's a requirement um, for COVID-19 because people that are coughing and sneezing and transmitting the virus to healthy people, that's a concern. That's called droplet transmission. And Right now, we think within about a six feet distance. So if somebody is six feet away from you coughing and sneezing, um, the likelihood of those droplets transmitting to you is lower than if they were closer than six feet. Although that data is still being collected on that. And right now where we are in April, the CDC is recommending face masks for going out into public right now, going to grocery stores, going to pump your gas, whatever, because of the possibility that it could be closer than a six feet transmission. So um, six feet might not be enough to prevent transmission of COVID-19. In the final box here, we have blood. So direct contact by blood. And so this can fall into a couple different situation. So somehow it's getting into your blood, usually via the skin. So we have needles, general puncture wounds in the skin, or insect bites. I think that's what's being shown in this picture here. We see these insects coming and likely mosquitoes would be a good example, although there's some others. And within insects here, we actually have a name for these. We call them biological vectors. We'll do another slide next on that to clarify what that means. But biological vectors are infected with a pathogen and can they, they can directly transmit that pathogen to you by biting you. A good example is a mosquito. Okay, now let's go to the indirect method, okay, where you're not coming directly in contact with somebody who is sick. So there are these indirect methods of transmission. The top box, we're looking at somebody touching a door handle, and this method of transmission we would call fomite transmission. So a fomite is defined as, as a non-living object or surface that harbors the pathogen temporarily. So the pathogen is present on this surface, and then if somebody comes along and touches that surface, then they become infected. So bacteria and viruses can reside outside the body on surfaces. And they can be on door handles and they can be on bedding and clothing and, and that sort of thing. So we have to be careful about what we touch with our bare hands right now. The estimation for SARS-CoV-2 is that it survives on surfaces for about uh, one to two days outside of the body on a surface where it seems to be surviving better on steel and on plastic than on, say, cardboard or clothing. And that's really variable from pathogen to pathogen. How long can they survive outside the body? Viruses, it's a lot less um, compared to bacteria because viruses are completely dependent on the human body or on an animal body, on a cell to reproduce. So it's not going to survive really that long outside the body. It's highly variable. It could be just maybe a few, um, in some cases, it's just a few minutes outside the body to, it could be potentially days or for some bacteria, think about spore forming bacteria when they make spores. That can even be in 
sort of indefinite amount of time that the pathogen can survive on a non-living object on a fomite surface. Okay, this box, we see this person preparing food. Okay, so this would be transmission indirectly through food, contaminated food or water. So the food or water has become contaminated. And then when we actually have something connecting a term here, connecting both fomite transmission and food and water transmission, we call that fecal to oral transmission which is sometimes what happens is the pathogen is in the feces. And so if we aren't properly washing our hands after using the restroom, then that pathogen gets onto the food or the water that we touch with our hands. And then a healthy person will eat that food or drink that water or touch that object, which it would be contaminated now with fecal bacteria or fecal virus or some other fecal pathogen. And then you touch your mouth or you eat it, it goes in through the mouth as the portal of entry, and then you become sick. So we call that the fecal to oral method of transmission. Okay, the last box we have um, somebody who's coughing and we also have some rat droppings in the area. We would call this a method of indirect trans transmission, it's called airborne. It is different than droplet transmission. Droplet transmission, you're having these respiratory droplets that are present in on surfaces usually or temporarily in the air. But airborne, we really have these infectious particles in the air for long periods of time. And so sometimes there's infectious agents that are transmitted by animals and it's in their droppings. And so we say there are these invisible aerosols that are in the air. And then you just walk by and pick up those, those aerosols by just simply breathing, you pick, you pick up the pathogen. So that's what airborne transmission means. Let's talk more about vectors vectors of infectious disease. So we have animal vectors, usually insects, that can transmit the pathogenic microorganism to the human, and two different categories. So we have biological vectors, and the big difference here is that they are themselves infected, meaning that the parasite, the microorganism, actually completes part of its life cycle inside of this particular insect and then that infected insect transmits to humans. And the three classic examples of biological vectors in microbiology would be mosquitoes, fleas, and ticks. So these would all be biological vectors where the, these animals are in fact infected with the pathogen and they transmit the pathogen by biting the human and we get direct into blood okay so the pathogen is going to go into the blood of the human okay contrast that to mechanical vectors so if we use that word referring to animals or insects Mechanical vectors, here we have a cockroach and we have a housefly. And what that means is that they're not infected internally, but they may actually harbor the pathogen maybe on their surface. And this could be because these particular insects, they tend to really like poop. And so flies in particular are attracted to the smell of feces and then they'll land on that feces and they'll just basically get covered in poop, little poop particles. And then what happens is the fly acts as a mechanical vector if it flies over to your sandwich and lands on it and deposits some fecal pathogens from the feet of the fly and then the fly lands on your sandwich and you transmits it that way. Same thing with the cockroach. 
So these animals aren't directly infected. They're just happy to be wearing the pathogen on their surface and they can act as a mechanical vector. The term reservoir is another one that you should be familiar with here. So reservoir, a permanent place for the infectious agent to reside and reproduce. So usually the case too with those biological vectors is that there is a reservoir where that pathogen is reproducing and spending most of its time. Now it's possible for the reservoir to be non-living. So it could be an environmental reservoir, soil or water, or some sort of moist surface where the pathogen is replicating or that reservoir could be the living, it could be a living source. So inside of animal or the humans. So here we're looking at some pictures of some very common living reservoirs for pathogens, mice, rats, chicken, and even mosquito can be a reservoir. Um, bats. Bats are in the news a lot right now because that is the suspected original source of SARS-CoV-2. It looks like it comes from bats, although that might not have necessarily been the vector of transmission to humans. It's unclear right now if the bat CoV-2 virus crossed directly into humans or if the bat virus, the bat coronavirus transmitted to an intermediate host like a civet cat is one proposed um, hypothesis, although we don't know for sure right now. The data is still being analyzed, and because we can't get into China right now, for um, United States researchers, we can't get into China, so we aren't able to get in there and do the contact tracing to see if we can figure out the trace pattern of where this SARS coronavirus 2, how it actually transmitted into humans. But what we can do is we can take this, the DNA sequence of SARS CoV 2, we can compare it to known bat coronaviruses, and it's looking at about 95% similar to bat coronaviruses. So that has led scientists to temporarily conclude that SARS CoV 2 originated in bats. And this is also an example of zoonotic. You see that word on the slide too. This is a really important word to understand. Zoonotic diseases originate in wildlife and cross into the human population. And that's because there are a lot of similarities in cell structures and receptors among mammals. And humans are mammals and um, you know bats are mammals. And so, we can see this crossover occur. It's random events. We don't know for sure, but this has happened in the past and it will continue to happen where animal diseases will cross into humans. If the pathogen is able to mutate slightly to now be able to bind to the human receptors in the same way that it can bind to the animal receptors or cause the same or similar types of diseases. So it's possible for reservoirs to be humans. Now, usually when we use that term for a human reservoir, a lot of times we refer to, to human reservoirs as carriers. So on this slide, we're looking at using that term carrier and we're defining it as an individual who inconspicuously shelters the pathogen and can spread it to others without knowing. And so the word inconspicuously means that there's no outward physical evidence of that pathogen. So we're talking about people who aren't showing signs or symptoms of the infection. All right, so we've got this woman here and she's happily dancing with some people and 
these little, so in all these pictures, you see these little circles here. These represent the pathogen. So there's the pathogen present in all of these individuals, but they're all carriers, meaning that they're unaware potentially that they are harboring the pathogen. So this would be an example of somebody we would call asymptomatic. carriers. So what that means is that they're showing no symptoms. And they may be just completely unaware that they are infected. Good example of this are a lot of sexually transmitted infections, STIs, like gonorrhea and chlamydia, especially in women. Women don't tend to have as many of the symptoms as men. And so it's possible for somebody to have picked up an STI like gonorrhea or chlamydia and not know it and pass it through sexual contact. Um, this guy here, it's a very similar situation. We would call him an incubating carrier. Which means that he is in the incubation phase of the infection. Remember, the incubation phase is the period from when you first become exposed to the pathogen to when you begin showing signs or symptoms. So the incubation phase in this case, and in most cases actually, is asymptomatic. So in the picture, we're seeing that his microbes are multiplying inside of his body, but right now he is really unaware that he is infectious. And this is one of the major reasons why COVID-19 is such a concern is that there's real evidence that people are asymptomatic carriers of the virus and transmitting it to healthy people unknowingly. And this is why hopefully quarantine and social distancing and wearing masks will help with the spread of this virus. Okay, let's take this woman here with the purple shirt. You can see she's got her pathogen. It's invisible inside of her body. Um, she's just getting out of bed. You see that? She's stretching and getting out of bed. She feels better. She's recovering <laughs> from, an, from an infection. She's finally getting out of bed. She's feeling good. But you know what? Even when you're in the recovery phase, you're still possibly able to pass that pathogen on to somebody who's healthy. And so we call this person a convalescent carrier because she's in the convalescent stage in the infection cycle. So remember, the convalescent stage is, or phase, is the recovery phase. She's recovering. She finally feels better. Her immune system is scaling back their efforts. So interleukin signaling is going down and you're starting to not feel as achy. Your fever is probably gone. You're feeling like yourself again. So you decide to get out of bed and just be careful there because you can still infect people. Okay, what if the pathogen never gets out of your system? Does that ever happen? Yes. These are called chronic carriers. So this is the woman here, pictured here. She's making food. She does have the pathogen in her body and she is transmitting it to the food. Likely that's gonna be through the fecal to oral route of transmission, which means that this would be from improper hand washing after using the bathroom. She has fecal bacteria on her hands and she transmits it to the food and the food acts as a as a vehicle transmission or as an indirect transmission to healthy people. So she's a chronic carrier. This doesn't happen all the time, but there are some infections that do, um, that, that this, this can happen. There's a really famous story of Typhoid Mary. She's called Typhoid Mary because she transmits typhoid fever to dozens of people in the early 1900s and she does this because she's a cook in people's homes and everywhere she goes this this trail of 
of people getting typhoid fever and dying, in some cases even dying, and it's because she is a asymptomatic chronic carrier. So these people are asymptomatic as well. Remember, they're kind of unknowingly harboring a pathogen and then transmitting it to people. And she was actually in denial of this. She eventually was, was quarantined um, till she died. And then when she died, they did an autopsy on her, typhoid Mary, and they found out she harbored the bacteria in her gallbladder. And the bacteria that causes typhoid fever is salmonella typhi. Last type of carrier I want to mention is pictured here. We have a healthcare worker taking care of a sick person, handling a bedpan, it looks like, picking up the pathogen. Be very careful, healthcare workers, because you are an indirect carrier of pathogens. So now she comes over to this patient and she didn't wash her hands, I guess, or not very effectively after she handled the sick person's bedpan, and now she's transmitting it to this healthy person. And this is what we call a passive carrier. So a good example of this is transmission within hospitals via healthcare workers. Healthcare workers that are constantly touching sick people and then they might go and take care of another person and there you go, transmit the pathogen to that healthy person accidentally, not intentionally, but because for whatever reason, these people didn't pay attention during their microbiology class, right? <laughs> they didn't learn that, hmm, we can pass this on to people if we don't wash our hands or change gloves with every patient or change a mask with every patient. So that's why that protective, that personal protective equipment is not only really important to the healthcare worker in protecting themselves, so not infecting yourself accidentally when you're handling and taking care of people who are sick, but it's also really important for not spreading infections to other people in the hospital who you are taking care of.